Good, but let's go back, uh, back to, the, to the demos, back to the ideas we had here. Again, when you think about the last time we had the linear model, now we have to make the move to a logistic regression model. So that means something also for us, changing it from the, let's say, sine function to the sigmoid function, squashing everything between zero and one. That's what we had uh, basically um, already here with this particular function. So all what we change is essentially instead of a sine, I use now this function and I have a complete new hypothesis and basically also a new model that we call then logistic regression. Logistic because of uh, basically or regression because of this real valued behavior. And um, this gives us here, this logistic function really, then a very smoother curve. So that's what we discussed. And still we have to find the right model. So we're still not sure about the Ws. Um, and this is why we come to this optimization, right? So the idea is now very similar. We have to play and search basically to this target function through the space by changing the Ws. Um, now think about logistic regression and our problem case at hand, we said it's a binary classification problem. And when we now do basically this data frame select distinct on results, which is our guiding label Y, right, that we learned, suddenly we see there's uh, actually not only fail and pass, right? There's fail, business not located, pass with conditions out of business. And that is what we experience in practical data science topics all the time. Right. If you go to real problems like you have, the data is usually never clean, right? So it's always dirty. There's something error values. There's something which you have to first clean in order to use classification, in order to use machine learning. You prepare features. You basically work on the data first and I have to understand it. Obviously here it helps us not if, you know, the result is, yeah, business not located. So it has nothing to do with our binary classification problem. And no matter in which domain I was working, it's always the case. It's only that, of course, Kaggle data sets or used for training, those are very clean and beautiful um, available. Um, but of course, when you go to real application problem, often you have this in the data that you really have to inspect the data. You have to maybe visualize the data to understand it. And, and you here basically see that also when we come back to our cloud and you know do a data frame show, and want them to show us this distinct, um, basically, elements of the results, which is really our guiding uh, label Y, then you see that's essentially, um, yeah, a bit problematic for our use case. So hence, what we have to do is to pick out and decide uh, what will I, you know, join as classes. That could be something we have seen. And this takes queuing time a little bit here on the cluster. So let's go a little bit here. So we have seen that we have now five classes, so it makes sense to visualize them, how dramatic is the case. And now we come to your problem we just discussed with the class unbalance, right? So you have exactly the same case here. You have uh, very many in pass, just a couple of fails. So every classifier which will be just working on this purely will have already a problem being biased to one area. Now, still, we can learn maybe from other elements that there's a pass with conditions. And if you say we want to have binary, we maybe can merge those because these people still passed but have some conditions to do. So in the end, it's something where we maybe can merge classes. And what we sometimes do in data science is we just sample out some of those which are not so, let's say, dramatic. And you would see business located is relatively a small percentage or out of business is a small percentage. We can just sample those out of the data set. Still, we have three classes, basically fail, pass, and pass with conditions. And essentially, this is something what we do in the in the next Python code. You see this here, the label for the results. We merge now with fail and pass, but also add one of this. This is actually then the one later that basically we will filter and will add them to our pass with conditions here, you see, and pass will be joined. And then the one with fail and the others here are filtered out, which are basically out of business and um, these elements. So let's see if the cloud is, is still queuing. So maybe that is, you know, I was not using the notebook for quite some time. The, one of the issues, the kernel is idle. So let's see. I can still try to do this. It should be no harm if there's anything. Ah, okay, that works. Now you see again how the Spark job is executed on the cluster. And, and running, 
and doing, let's say, performing different application and is completed. That's already what we discussed on the slides, you know, the different labels, which are in our case now a five class classification problems that we don't want. We want a binary one. That means we have to do something. And now we, we visualize this. Um, this is just some basically SQL inherent command. I also noted that for you a little bit here on the on the um, different slides so that you have it for a documentation, how to work with this. But essentially, we're now looking at this a little bit and plotting the data um, uh, with basically also, of course, getting the results then first from the cluster and, and basically filling then always the results that we get um, with the Spark jobs that you see there are now executed and uh, basically give us now the count of all of those, right? We wanted to know, if you remember for this graphic, how many of those are actually results, um, the labels business not located or out of business. And if you see compared to all the other classes, they're relatively few, so I can sample them out without crushing the quality of the data. Still, I want to merge the past with conditions with those. That should be also okay. But in the inherent overall problem we have, we have still lots of, let's say, past ones compared to relatively less than failing. So still, also when we don't do more and more of the sampling, this is something to consider. So this is a graphic you have seen. And then we said we want to merge these classes now in the cloud um, and basically fill them together. Again, here we fill another data flame and select just those where the label is bigger than zero. And you see here, all of those we want to filter, we put as minus one. So there will be not any more in the, in the new data frame that we do. With this, we have now our labeled data, which is kind of correct, um, which is of course important for us. We have still the violations here. We have the label essentially now merged. And this brings us now a proper binary classification problem that we can apply. So let's come a bit back to what we do in terms of preparing really the modeling, right? So this is basically work on the data to prepare it for the binary classification model and logistic regression. We could not just throw the data that we had on it, it would fail because it was a five class problem. In this sense, um, this is something very typical you do in machine learning by using, you know, initial data analysis, but things we do right now, visualization and so forth. Still, there was no machine learning so far, right? This is a typical way of preparing machine learning models, but the machine learning now is just starting. And now we have this big hypothesis set, right? As I discussed, so we have trees, which basically are very prone to overfitting. That's why Many people use rather forests, you grow 1,000 trees or 10,000 trees and, and basically do some bagging and boosting to it. You have different, uh, let's say, algorithms. Today, you would also, of course, go to neural networks if you have lots of data in classification algorithms. But that is something where Spark alone is not good in. You have to combine Spark there with some, let's say, deep learning um, libraries that we will learn in lecture six and lecture seven. But in the end, now we have a huge, let's say, idea of classification algorithms you can pick from this machine learning library without thinking about the scalability. We'll be automatically scaling to the amount of big data that you have in hand. We pick the logistic function and the logistic regression model. I think that's by now very clear. But the key message I wanted to show you here a little bit with this is also this pipelining. Now we had done a lot of work on the data already. And now we prepared further for the uh, kind of um, for the classifier in the sense that we have already done in the last lecture. So we want to have a very compressed vector with all the information instead of lots of text. Hence, I have to have our violation data, if you remember, which is lots of lots of lots of text now actually broken into smaller pieces, which we call a tokenizer here, um, essentially here. And then we basically put the words in a through a hashing function then in so-called feature vector. So we come to a very compressed way of how the words now in, in their frequency in the text will influence this vector, right? If there's lots of repair, repair, missing, 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 this will add up. So this vector will represent the, let's say, uh, those bad words or good words, of course, on the other hand of the scale, how good the restaurant is, right? You can follow this. Now the trouble, that we have, of course, is when we do this here now for training, what the fit section is. We also have to do this later for the testing. 
right? So in the end, you see that essentially with new unseen data have the same thing to do. Hence, it makes sense in practice um, to create so-called pipelines. Here's a very small pipeline as an example in teaching where you have first the tokenizer of some text then the hashing and basically this is feature word vectors. You now have a feature set like we did in the last lecture, uh, very compressed to put in the logistic regression model. Now the logistic regression is now where machine learning is really happening in terms of training. Right now we have this iteration, what you learned also in Anna's course with the stochastic gradient descent, taking the derivative, having the error function, and then go downhill the error function until I hopefully arrive to something what is a global minima, but you probably also learn from her. Often you get stuck in the in the local minima. That's why you can adjust the learning rate and to you know, go quicker downhill or slower downhill to really spot sometimes these, these kind of traps in the data, which are the local minima. Also, chances are that you never find the global minima because it's not so easy to get to. But by adjusting the learning rate, you can do this. But of course, when you do this, you have to retrain and again retrain and again retrain. It will add to your computational complexity. But in the end, um, you could do this iteratively, which suggests these, um, you know, these iterations again and again, the change in weights. And over time, you have something coming out called the logistic regression model. So this is really something, if you remember with the perceptrons, we had this where the weights add up, where something is fixed. And basically after 10 iterations, we just cut here and say, okay, early stopping, that's it, what we want. This is now a piece, a really a thing, so to speak. So we can store this in the pipeline as a real model, which is now for our disposal. And you see exactly this is the difference now for testing, right? When I now basically do the testing step, there is nothing like the logistic regression anymore. We don't need that. We just pick logistic regression model, which was trained already, and use it just with the data. Still, I have to do all the elements with the raw text, with the words, to put the same through the hashing function to the feature vectors to get the same data representation. And for this, it could be very nice to use this pipeline model and the transformer, which is already also in Spark, like you see here in the demo. Um, very nicely done. And I can also, of course, show you this a little bit here uh, in live, so to speak. Still queuing, but I guess uh, it's maybe an update problem. So that should be probably working like this. And here you see already the, the elements from the um, model pipeline fit. Um, in the end, this doesn't harm us uh, because essentially here we just take one of the labeled data and want to show it. Um, you see here the kernel ready, there was something happening. It was maybe too much idle. Um, in this sense, it's probably executed, but we also don't really have an influence here. But here's something, a lot of things are basically happening. Right here, I switch to the logistic regression function. I use this pipeline model. And then I say, instead of just what we did the last time, logistic regression fit, here we now fit the whole pipeline so it would all start using the violation, the tokenizer, the hashing function to get to the to this kind of um, whole pipeline through in the data. And then the fit, of course, is something which is now very computation expensive. Hence, um, I hope that all of this executed before correctly. Um, you will see now that basically Spark is again used. And now as we train a function, of course, this means we have different stages. We go iteratively to basically do these steps. And uh, we'll see that um, we, we fit the data with this and have now a real model. But of course it goes again, it goes again. And as many as you know, Spark workers are just available to us or basically are um, basically not you know, are already idle because they have done their job. Because sometimes they get data items which are very simple to process, the quicker done than maybe others which are more harder to process. And this is a nice thing that you don't see really in Google Colab working, right? There you are always in the local environment, you have just one node. There's nothing, although you use Spark, but the real power of Spark comes with HD Insight here as an example, really by rolling out now to all these workers that you have. So this was highly in parallel. And this, what you just seen can, for instance, now digest violations of 100 terabyte, of 200 terabyte of data, one petabyte of data, no problem. You just keep it running. Right? And if it fails, we learned also in one of lecture three, it actually will reactivate the, this workers which failed. There will be an, a vault tolerism inside this framework so that you resubmit those which are failed, which is also important because in one petabyte of data, you don't want to look and see, ah, this particular part of the data set was not 
fitted, so I put it again in the pot. So you don't have time for that in data, in big data sets, right? You can do this with small data, but not with, let's say, real big data. Good. Um, having done that, I think we are almost on the level of the slides. So that was the beginning of the pipeline, right? That was a one one side, you know what's happening there. Um, that was a stochastic gradient descent that we have seen now basically broken up and used it with different data set, still averaging the errors basically to get, let's say the way how you want to go down the curve to minimize the error function, which is our key goal. However, we also have seen that after certain iterations, it will stop and then gives you the model out. And of course, this is a hyperparameter. You can now say you, you've seen that a little bit here in the code. Um, basically, this is a max eta 10. And one of your assignments we do in assignment one per group, you will change this. Some groups will have 20, some others have 10, some others have two. And we'll see how it reflects the accuracy rate or more precisely the confusion matrix. Right, so that is um, something what you will see. Of course, you don't give the optimizer a chance to learn if you just have two iterations. However, if you do 200 iterations, you maybe overfit the data as we call that, and then it's also not good. So there's a certain area, again, would be two or three university lectures from me really showing what the difference between overfitting and underfitting and so on. And also then where regularization comes into the play with early stopping and things like that. But yeah, for this, you really have to take a more proper um, you know, machine learning course. Here is more the idea now uh, that we have this regression model now in Spark. You can deploy it essentially and people can use it when you perhaps have a really production environment in a bank or something. Good, let's see, the cloud is here. Um, now we want to basically test the model that we have done. So we use a food inspections tool for it. You remember we used food inspection one data set, it was a training data set. Now we have a complete different data set two in order to test the model. In this sense, we use this um, actually now again, loading the test uh, data set to our cluster. We see basically very similar things here, the violations again, the results which we're interested in, the prediction and so forth. So again, we have to take this whole of the data set and essentially thinking about um, putting this again to the pipeline. So when we now look through all the activities here of the data, um, and some of the slides are really very similar like the ones we had in lecture two and lecture three, that's why I go a bit quicker, right? We just have another example here uh, when you come to it and basically then do the same things here uh, in terms of um, you know fitting the model and to revisit this, what that means in our diagram, we have now this learning algorithm that we added to the game. Right, so SGD is now the learning algorithm for logistic regression and optimizer. So you would say that all of the hypothesis set that we have, have a certain learning algorithm. Support vector machines as a hypothesis set has quadratic programming as a learning algorithm. Uh, neural networks have back propagation as learning algorithm. Logistic regression uses our optimizer SGD. They are all come together, but are separate entities. They have nothing to do with each other, right? I can also stick in neural networks SGD, I can do an Adam optimizer, can do other things there. But these are, let's say, the, the ideas. And we have seen that in the beginning already with the perceptron learning model and the perceptron learning algorithm, which then was basically bumping down the arrow and get us a line. Now, putting this in our overall diagram, we know that's basically where we are right now. And after doing this 10 iterations, we have something like maybe the final hypothesis. There's just one thing we didn't touch really yet. And this thing is loaded, which is then of course our error rates and error, how I know I get better, right? So this is a bit missing. However, we know that from already beginning of the course, that's the analogy. We have done the training, essentially all of this. And then I have something which basically is um, in line with our perceptual learning model was we had right in the beginning of the course. So the Ws which are red and unknown are filled and this makes up our model. Everything else is constant. That's what we had already before the data set. Now thinking about um, this error measure, which is not there. It's also usually um, a complete, um, you know, one lecture because there could be lots of hiccups in machine learning about this, but we need an error measure in terms of our SGD, we're very fine. It uses, for instance, a pointwise error or any other error function can be defined, which you see on the right-hand side, so that you have basically a loss function, 
that you always will look and see the performance of your uh, basically model while training. And of course, the goal is to get knock this down, right? To get the error measured down. And that is exactly what we have to integrate a little bit here in our diagram. These algorithms would not work if you don't have any measure to it. Unsupervised learning is of course a little bit different, but it has also a sort of error measure to optimize. But then the supervised one definitely needs an error measure to knock down the training. And now you have essentially all this core ingredients what a machine learning system needs. You just exchange every now and then support vector machines and you know basically quadratic programming packages. And then you're basically ready for all the machine learning uh, problems you have. Remember that machine learning is, is a bit different. Uh, it's not really mathematics because we have real life data, which is not mathematically friendly. We would say you look a movie on Netflix and once you say it's good, once it's bad, it's in the database and it has the same vector X in your same user, same preferences, same movie, but different Y's, right? This is not the mathematical function. If you remember, right? The function is always defined as the same X, the same Y out. But in Netflix and in our practical data set, we don't have that. There's many, the same Ys give different labels. And for certain reasons, because machine learning rather assumes a so-called probability distribution around that data. And we can solve this by just putting this essentially around. In other words, you would not do the Netflix data analysis and then put it to Amazon, you know, Prime or something like this. So usually assume that the probability distribution where the original data comes from is very similar to those where you basically then deploy the model because it could be fine nuances which make trouble. And towards the end, um, we know what happens at the end. We want to do the testing. Um, I already talked in the cloud a little bit about this, how that looks like, how we can do this. Um, essentially here with a second data set we have already used and loaded. We can now basically see and look into some predictions of the data um, and do some you know, analysis I already was alluding to something which was a confusion matrix, for example, and things like that. But of course, now we take the second part, the test set, but it's equally encoded the same way. So we have to put it again through the whole pipeline. And this brings us then the predictions. The interesting thing in this pipeline is we just reuse it with the model that we have, right? The so logistic model is already trained here. So we can simply reuse it in this and don't have to train, don't have to do the SGD, the FIT or something. We just test it, test it, test it with new data sets, which makes it now to the testing. And usually inference is quite cheap, right? You can now scale this up very highly because you can do this with data point by data point. You don't need the average on the gradings anymore on the basically downhill path of the optimizer. That's why the inference or the testing is usually very nice in parallel computing. You can really scale that very up. And here are some preparations um, to essentially come to something we then later call a confusion matrix to see an overview. These are just simple database, um, let's say preparations you see as SQL to prepare, let's say some fail, some you know, pass and uh, different of these kind of results and then putting them in a nice um, way. Again, nicely to see here that even this crawling of data is again done on the cluster Think about that you maybe do this with predictions of one petabyte. So this could maybe take now 48 hours to do it in the cloud. And then you come back to the next parts uh, that you have here in the data set. Or you apply 200 workers if you can afford it. It goes in half an hour, but you go and pay the price for it, right? 200 workers with high memory costs a lot of money. So these are just simple summary statistics and there are many of those. Um, there are different scores that you can compute. Um, usually the, the good thing is when you just have accuracy, it's a bit not really um, conclusive in the sense of saying that, you know, it could be the point that if you have a missed class balance that you still have 90% right, but the, the one unbalanced class is never really good predicted. So in this sense, you have a really, um, you know, there are two reasons really. One is this kind of misbalance. And then the other one is if you have really, let's say a multi-class problem and with the multi-class problem, you come then to the, to the problem that maybe still you have a very good accuracy rate, but for three classes, it's absolutely not working. So you have one, the really unbalanced class, you know, 90% from 100 are always right or in every time of these steps. And this means that usually the accuracy rate alone 
doesn't help you necessarily to say it's a good classifier. That's why we prepare here with these SQL queries a so-called uh, confusion matrix. It's a bit graphically showing you here what was really correctly classified and what was basically not correctly classified, counting the values. Um, have you done the confusion matrix with Anna's course? I believe so. Huh? Yeah, okay. So I would, was thinking not here. It's a bit uh, this thing misleading because a positive result means here a failed food inspection because we wanted to predict it if they would fail. That's why a positive is basically here, not the negative, but a failed element. And we want to do this also essentially here in the cloud to finish up. The select statements take some time. It takes now basically the data basically base that we have seen and rolls it out again as a job on the Spark cluster. Yeah, just one minute more than we, we basically done. And here are the last, last things. It also tells you, of course, that the, that basically what we said in the beginning is, is probably right. We have to maybe work, work better on the classifier because we had, you know, 3,000 fails and I think around 8,000 positive ones. So maybe the classifier is biased to more positive aspects. But in the end, um, that would be now starting doing another model, maybe a much better model than just simple logistic regression. We will learn also other ones later in the course, right? So there will be recommender engines that I just talked about this Netflix. We will talk about how that works with collaborative filtering techniques. Um, we will have clustering, uh, which is an unsupervised learning technique. I was already alluding to a little bit, but these are topics we do then in lecture 11. But also here you could use, for instance, um, Spark because you have the alternating least squares that give rise to collaborative filtering also in Spark. And KBeans is also implemented in Spark, just as an example. Good, that's all for basically the demonstration. You have seen Hardy Insight, quite complex um, compared to a little bit of SkyKit Learn. But what you get, of course, is the scalability in Rentme, right? So now you're ready for a petabyte of data and don't fear it anymore, so to speak, or subsample, which is also very bad these days, mostly because you have in big data always something useful inside. Good, this was working. I think we just stop here. Remember, there will be the third course hour um, today. And yeah, so thank you very much and see you next time, I think in lecture four.